Uh, I told you last week that I would finish the story of Balaam and Balak, and, and I told you I didn't know when I was going to do that. And uh, as Paul Harvey would say, today you're going to get the rest of the stories. I decided to go ahead and finish that today. So I invite you to open up to Jeremiah 17, and eventually we'll be going to the book of Numbers in just a moment. But Jeremiah chapter 17, read with me verses 9 and 10, please. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. We read this passage last week. And Jeremiah says that our hearts can deceive us. Our hearts can mislead us. We, we might think that our hearts are right before God, when in reality they're not. And God knows the truth. And we talked last week from Deuteronomy chapter 13 where God said to the people of Israel, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams comes to you, and if he even makes a prediction about things that may happen in the future, which normally would be a sign that this is a true prophet of God. If a prophet made a prediction and it came true, then you could rest assured that God sent him. But God says about this man in Deuteronomy 13, even if he makes a prediction that comes true, don't listen to that prophet because he is telling you that it's time for us to follow other gods. It's time for us to turn away from Jehovah and to go to the idols of the nations around us. And God says, don't you listen to that man. In fact, not only should you not listen to him, but you should take him out of the city and you should stone him with stones until he dies because he's trying to mislead you. But he said in Deuteronomy 13 and verse 3 that if this happens, that if this prophet comes and he tries to entice you away from God by telling you something you know is not what God wants, God says you need to know that I'm testing you. I'm putting you to the test to see if you love me with all of your heart or if you don't. As we talked about that passage last week, I used Numbers chapter 22. You can go ahead and be turning over there if you'd like. Numbers chapter 22 and the story of Balaam and the donkey. Now coincidentally, the kids in their Bible classes are talking about that exact story right now. So I had a bunch of kids come up and say, hey, we're studying about that story in our Bible classes. And isn't it interesting that a donkey was talking? Yes, it is. That's one of the unique stories of the Old Testament in that way. But Balaam is a, is a prophet of sorts. I say he's a prophet of sorts because he is not a prophet of God. I told you last week that Balaam is not a good guy. He is not a good character in the story. Although, he does say some things in the story that give the indication that maybe he is a prophet of God. We're going to see some things that Balaam says this morning that give the impression, if we don't read carefully, that he is a prophet of God, that he's a good prophet, but he is not. And we'll see that as we go throughout the story this morning. And so as I said, what I want to do is continue this story of Balaam and Balak. Now let me just give you a little bit of a reminder of what we studied last week in chapter 22. The people of Israel, led by Moses, are making their way to the land of Canaan. And they come to the land of Moab. They're not in Canaan yet. They're outside of it. And they come to the territory of the Moabites. Now Balak is the king of the Moabites. And Balak has heard some stories about what the Israelites have done to the other nations and territories that they've come to. And Balak is terrified. And so Balak gets this idea. I'm going to reach out to Balaam, who is a prophet for hire. Balaam is the kind of man who would come and he would do your bidding. He would prophesy whatever it was you wanted him to say. It just depended on how much money you gave him. So Balak sends messengers to Balaam. And he says, here's some money. Here's some gifts. Please come to our land, come to Moab, and curse the people of Israel. Speak a curse against them so that they cannot come and fight against us. But God explicitly said to Balaam, you will do no such thing. 
And Balaam came out. He spoke to Balak's messengers and he said, I can't do it. God has spoken to me and he told me not to go with you, not to curse the people. The messengers leave. They go back to Balak and they say, here's what happened. Here's what he told us. He's not coming. So in chapter 22 and verse 15, it says Balak sent a second group of messengers, this time more numerous and more honorable and probably with more money to go back to Balaam a second time and say, okay, we mean it this time. We want you to come with us and curse the Israelites. Now, instead of Balaam just coming out and saying, listen, I told you already, God has forbidden me from coming with you. I'm not going to do it. Balaam says, tell you what, let me go talk with God again and see if he changes his mind. And so the second time these messengers come, God speaks to Balaam and he says, go ahead. If they ask you to come, go with them. Go with them. But only say the things that I tell you to say. Now in chapter 22 and verse 22, we read, after Balaam decides to go with them, God becomes angry with Balaam. And you say, that's not right. Why did God get mad at him after he had told him to go? Because God told him the first time, don't go with them. But you see, God knows Balaam's heart. You remember Jeremiah 17 we just read a moment ago? God says, I know what's in your heart. I test the heart. I search the heart. God knows that what Balaam really wants is to go with them and to get paid. And so God says, fine. Go with them if they ask you to go. But he becomes angry with Balaam for doing that. And then the rest of chapter 22 is the story of the donkey talking to Balaam. And we're not going to go through that again. Let's make our way now into chapter 23 when Balaam arrives and sees Balak. So let's start off talking about the interaction between Balaam the seer and Balak the king of Moab. So verse, verse 1 Balaam said to Balak, build seven altars for me here and prepare for me seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did just as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balak offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Now, after they offer these sacrifices, Balaam is going to come and he is going to do what it is that Balak wants. He's going to try and pronounce a cursing on the people of Israel. But guess what? God won't let him do it. As Balaam opens his mouth and begins to speak, instead of cursing Israel, he blesses them instead. He says good things about them. And this makes Balak really confused and somewhat angry. In chapter 23, if you look at verse 11, Balak said to Balaam, what have you done? I took you to curse my enemies and look, you have blessed them bountifully. And here's what Balaam says. Must I not, verse 12, take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? Balak, I I'm saying what God wants me to say. And so Balak says, okay, we're going to try this again. We're going to do this again. Balaam is going to try to curse them a second time. But if you look at chapter 23 and in verse 25, Balak said to Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. In other words, Balaam, if all you're going to do is bless this people, just keep your mouth shut. Stop doing this. I want you to curse them, but you're not doing that. And so Balaam answered and said, Did I not tell you, saying all that the Lord speaks, that I must do? I can't help this, Balaam. I'm saying what God wants me to say. Now you read those passages of Balaam's responses to Balak and you say, well, that sounds like something a true prophet would say. I'm only going to say what God wants me to say. That sounds pretty good, right? But I take it that Balaam is not doing this of his own will. Balaam is saying this because God is speaking through him. This is what God wants to happen. I think that's just further confirmation of what God said to Balaam at the beginning. Don't go with those messengers. That nation, the Israelite nation, they are a blessed people. And I don't want them cursed. And God is just proving that as Balaam is trying to give these curses upon the people. So Balak, frustrated, angry with Balaam, says, Okay, we're going to do this a third time, Balaam. And this time, you're going to get it right. Alright? Now what do you think happens? Chapter 24. You guessed it. 
Balaam blesses them again instead of cursing them. And so verse 10 of chapter 24, Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam and he struck his hands together and Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Now verse 12, Balaam said to Balak, did I not also speak to your messengers whom you sent to me saying, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do good or bad of my own will. What the Lord says, that I must speak. Isn't this what I told you? I told you that I'm only going to say what God wants me to say. Again, you read that and you say, hey, this Balaam character seems like a pretty good dude. But that's why we have to keep reading. That's why we have to keep processing and seeing what is said in the story. In verse 15, Balaam does a fourth prophecy. And once again, he blesses instead of cursing. Balak is furious. And finally, Balak is going to give up. In verse 25 of chapter 24, Balaam rose and departed and returned to his place. Balak also went his way. Balak walks away frustrated and angry over this interaction. I've given Balaam money. I've offered to him even more money. I have offered to him power and influence, and he won't do what I ask. And so Balak finally throws up his hands and he walks away and Balaam walks away as well. Now the story doesn't end there. In chapter 25, we read about the people of Israel and their sin with the Midianite women. So chapter 25, which Arlie read for us at the beginning of our worship period this morning, it says in verse 1 that Israel remained in Acacia Grove and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They, the women of Moab, invited the people, the Israelites, to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And so Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And so the Moabite and the Midianite people come to the Israelite people and say, come and join in our worship. Come worship our gods and join in our religious customs. And the people of Israel go along with it. And we read a little bit later in this text, in verse 6, about one of the children of Israel, a man of Israel, came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Here, are, here is the nation going after the Moabite and the Midianite gods. And they're worshiping, they're offering sacrifices to those gods, but combined with that was sexual immorality that was involved with these women. So Israelite men are not only worshiping false gods, but they're committing fornication with Moabite and Midianite women. This is a big catastrophe. And because of what's happening... It says in verse 6 that there are some Israelite people who have gathered at the doorway of the tabernacle and it says they're mourning and they're grieving, presumably because of what's happening around them. These are righteous and godly people who see what their brethren are doing and they're upset about this and so they've gathered at the tabernacle, the place of worship, and they're mourning and they're grieving over this. And here comes this man. This one Israelite man in particular is singled out in verse 6. And he's coming along and he's got a Midianite woman on his arm. And it says that he walks her in front of the doorway of the tabernacle in the sight of Moses, in the sight of these who have gathered together and they're mourning about the nation's sin. He comes strutting through there with this Midianite woman. He takes her into his tent and uh, let me just say they're not going in there to play checkers. This is a brazen action on the part of this man. Right in front of Moses. Right in front of the door of the place.
place of worship for the Israelite people. And in verse 7, we're introduced to an important character. Now when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest. So Phineas is the grandson of Aaron. Okay? When he saw this, when he saw this man come through with this Midianite woman and take her into this tent, verse 7 says, He rose from among the congregation and he took a spear in his hand and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and he thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman, through her body. Hello. Hello. While Israel is engaging in this sinful worship and in the sin of fornication with these Moabite Midianite women, we learn at the end of verse 7 that because of this, or excuse me, at the end of verse 8 rather, God sent a plague among the camp. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, it brought about swift death. This plague is moving through the Israelite camp and people are falling to the ground, dying instantly. But when Phineas rose up with the spear and he did what he did, it says that the plague stopped. God removed the plague from the nation and the people stopped dying. But verse 9 says that 24,000 people were killed in this plague. Now God is going to go on in verse 10 and following to say some good things about Phineas and what he did. I want to point out two things that God says about him. Look at verse 11 where he says, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Well, he did consume some of them. 24,000 of them were consumed in this plague. But God says that Phineas displayed zeal and he displayed God's zeal. Some of your translations might even say jealousy. That he displayed God's jealousy. And the idea there is God's hatred of sin. God's people, His nation, has gone out and they're worshiping idols and false gods and they're committing fornication with women from another nation whom God has clearly said to them, don't have anything to do with those people. And His people are doing both of these things and God is jealous. You know, God is jealous in the sense that He wants our love, He wants our affection and our obedience. And you know, there are some people that say God being a jealous God, that's kind of a petty thing. Your God seems kind of small. Your God seems like He gets all bent out of shape over small stuff. Well, I think it would be helpful to use this illustration as we think about God's jealousy. To those of you who are married, are you jealous over your spouse? Wives, are you jealous over your husband's love and devotion to you? Or do you want your husband to just go out and give that love and devotion to just any woman out there? How would you feel about that? Husbands, how would you feel if your wife was going out and giving what you Deserve and what is supposed to be given to you and that love and devotion and commitment. And she just goes out and she gives that to other men. How would you feel about that? So I think we need to back off God's case a little bit and say it's wrong for God to be jealous. A lot of people are doing that. It makes God seem petty and small. No, not any more than it does a husband or a wife who's jealous over their love and their affection. God says that Phineas displayed my zeal. He hated what he saw. It bothered him deep inside as he watched his people commit these egregious sins against God and he said, somebody's got to do something about it and it might as well be me. Here's a second thing that God says about Phineas. In verse 13, at the end of the verse, it says that he was zealous for his God and he made atonement 
for the children of Israel. I've always found that expression to be interesting. That somehow Phineas, in what he did, made atonement for the nation of Israel. When we think about atonement, we think about the, the shedding of blood, we specifically think about the shedding of Jesus' blood and how that brings atonement for our sin. And that's right. But I want to suggest to you that there's another aspect of atonement that is important in addition to the blood that is shed. And that aspect is displayed here in Phineas. You see, Christ's blood does not affect atonement for us if we do not come to hate the sin that is within us and choose to repent of it, to turn away from it. That's part of what makes atonement possible. We say, yes, God, we agree with you that these things that you have said are wrong are wrong. And I'm not going to do them anymore. And I want to hate that sin. I want to turn away from that sin and commit to you never to do it again. And forming that hatred of sin within us, thinking about sin in the same way God thinks about sin, that is part and parcel of atonement. And Phineas displays that. God, somebody needs to put a stop to this and I'm going to be the one who does it. And God says, you were zealous for me. You made atonement for the people. And I want to suggest to you that Phineas foreshadows Jesus in this story. Jesus came to this earth teaching us about what is right and what is wrong about what God wants for us and what God doesn't want for us. And when we take the teaching of Jesus and we make it ours, we believe it, we put it into our heart and we say, yes, Lord, that's right. I'm going to follow you in that. And then His blood is applied to us. Then atonement, reconciliation happens. He foreshadows Jesus here in a very strong and very beautiful way. Now, how does this story end? Well, we have to skip ahead six chapters to see how the story ends. Chapter 31 gives us the final parts of this story where now it's time for God to take vengeance on the Moabite and Midianite people. Verse 1 of chapter 31, The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of Israel. Afterward, you, Moses, shall be gathered to your people. So Moses is going to go to the Israelite people and he says, alright, let's gather up the troops and we're going to go and we're going to fight against the people of Midian. I want you to notice in verse 6 that the army is led by Phinehas. wonder why. But I also want you to notice verses 7 and 8. It says, they warred against the Midianites just as the Lord commanded Moses and they killed all the males. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed. It mentions some names of those, but notice whose name is mentioned last in verse 8. Balaam, the son of Beor. They also killed with the sword. Balaam is killed in this battle against the Midianites. How does he get wrapped up in this? How does he become involved in this? Why is it that Balaam is killed? Did he just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? Was this just coincidence? Was this just some bad luck on his part? I don't think so. Because you see a little bit later in the chapter when the people of Israel return from war and they've got all of the plunder and the spoil. I want you to look at verse 16, chapter 31, where the Scripture says, look, these women, this is what Moses says, these women, these Midianite women, they caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. You see, Balak got what he wanted. He wanted the people of Israel to be cursed. He wanted them to be weakened. Now, he didn't get it through Balaam's cursing and prophetic utterances. But he got it through some other means. And this passage tells us, as well as a couple of others we'll look at in just a second, 
that it was through Balaam's advice. Tell you what, Balak, here's what you can do. If I can't prophesy and say what you want, let me tell you another way that you could get the people of Israel to be cursed. And so apparently Balaam came to Balak and said, here's what you can do. The Israelite men can be enticed by the women of your nation and by the Midianite women. Why don't you set it up so that they can all worship the gods of Canaan together, the gods of the Moabites together, and see if you can get the women of Midian to entice the men of Israel. This was Balaam's design. Now that is confirmed for us in the New Testament. I want to go to Revelation chapter 2. You know, Balaam is mentioned a few times in the New Testament. Revelation chapter 2. And we're given more pieces to the puzzle. Revelation chapter 2, this is in the context of, of Jesus' words to the seven churches of Asia. I'm sure you're familiar with those. In the message to the church at Pergamos, which begins in chapter 2 and verse 12, read verse 14 where Jesus says, I have a few things against you because you have there in your church those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Well, what did Balaam do? Jesus said, that Balaam taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Doesn't Jesus here confirm, Numbers 31, 16, that Balak acted through the counsel of Balaam? And what Balaam did was come to him and say, here's how you can get what you want. If you can't get it through my prophetic utterance, here's what you can do to bring the nation down. Go back to the book of Jude. The book right before Revelation. Just go back a few pages. Look at what it says in the book of Jude in verse 11. Now this is in the context of talking about false teachers who are having a, a severely negative influence on God's people. It says, woe to them in verse 11, these false teachers. What have they done? They've gone the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. What was Balaam's motivation? What did I say to you earlier? Money. Money. Balaam was greedy for money. And notice, Jude says these, these false prophets, he says they're running greedily to the error of Balaam. They're not content to walk there. I mean, they're going as fast as they can to get wealth in this unrighteous way. And then go back to 2 Peter chapter 2. A passage that is, that is very similar to the book of Jude. Again, talking about false teachers and the dangers that they pose. In 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 15 and 16. It says there that these false teachers have forsaken the right way and they've gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. There again, you see his motivation. It was greed. It was money. It was wealth. Balaam's heart was motivated by gain. And because of that... He seduced the nation of Israel into sin by going to Balak and saying, here's what you can do. This will surely work. Balaam's heart led him away from what God had clearly stated the very first time those messengers came. Don't go with them. Don't curse my people. And yet Balaam did what he wanted to do, not what God wanted him to do. And when, when Balaam couldn't get what he wanted through the usual conventional means, which for him was prophecy, when he couldn't get it that way, he found another way to pursue his greedy ambition. You know, when it comes to sin, we do what we do because we want what we want. Can I say that again? We do what we do 
Because we want what we want. And Balaam is willing to even deny clear statements of God. Direct statements of God made to him. He denies that. Because he wants what he wants. I think this whole story needs to be a lesson for us. Jeremiah said, the heart is desperately sick. It is deceitful. It is deceitful above all. And we may think that our heart is good and right. We may act in good conscience. And Jeremiah says that maybe we've done that because our heart has deceived us. And so we need to remember what God said to the people when He said, the Lord your God is testing you. And as I said last week, in the point that we made from Deuteronomy 13, if somebody comes along and says, hey, we, we, should, we should believe this, or we should practice this, when I know for a fact God's Word says no, it may be a test. In fact, it is a test. Let's just say it. It is a test. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues of life. The problems that we get into, the, the challenges that we deal with in life that are of our own doing, so often they flow from a heart that is not what it should be. A heart that is not thinking as it should. And yes, our hearts can think. So when we ask the question, should you follow your heart? I know what the movies say. Specifically the Hallmark movies. I know what they say. But the Bible says, maybe we should back up and think before we act on what we feel. We need to check our hearts. We need to make sure that they truly are right before God. Because if they are not, God will search it out and He will make it known. And we hope that He makes it known to us before it's too late. Because we don't want to stand before Him in judgment. Only to find out that we've been deceived. That we allowed ourselves to be misled. So I hope the lesson is helpful to you as we finished the story of Balaam and Balak. I appreciate your attention in these two lessons. Maybe I'm talking to somebody this morning. Somebody whose heart is being challenged by this story. Ask God, pray to God to search your heart and help you to see what He finds. To, to know what is in your heart. To pray as David prayed. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today to see if there is any false way within me. That's a good prayer that I think all of us need to be praying. If we can help you this morning, whether you're coming to Christ to become a Christian and begin serving Him for the first time, or if you need to come back to Him out of this world which is called back to you, come back to the Lord and begin serving Him anew. We invite you, please come as we stand and sing together.